Welcome everybody to the program this afternoon. We'd just like to invite you all to stand and worship with us as we sing of God's great faithfulness. Please join us. Great is thy faithfulness. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome along to the ordination service for, for Joel. And uh, on behalf of uh, the family of Joel, I want to thank you all for, for, for being here today. Uh, Joel has been um, in our conference since, uh, since the start of this year. And uh, this is a very special occasion uh, in the life of any, any minister. 
Uh, we are really delighted that uh, Joel is able to be joined today by his family that have come from North New South Wales. Uh, Joel's mother and father are here, his two sisters and brother are here, and uh, we really appreciate the fact that uh, you folk have have come to, to be here today. And, and I'm just going to, just for a moment, ask you all if you wouldn't mind standing um, for a moment just where you are, uh, because we really know that for Joel this is, this is really significant. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, most of Joel's ministry was in the North New South Wales Conference and uh, had Joel still been there and this ordination taken place there, uh, Joel would have been joined not only by the immediate family here, uh, but also by many other ministerial colleagues uh, and friends. And, uh, and so we really appreciate the fact that you folk are here. I understand there is also some other friends that have, that have driven from Newcastle. Um, and so we, we really appreciate you uh, making the trip to come, to come down uh, for this ordination. Thank you each and every one for being, uh, being here this afternoon and uh, witnessing and participating uh, in, this, in this program. Uh, I would uh, just invite you all uh, where you are to bow your heads and we're going to pray to God as we begin our program this afternoon. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for the blessings of this Sabbath day so far. Indeed, it's been a real spiritual feast. And now we've come to yet another spiritual highlight, the ordination of one of our ministers. Lord, we want to thank you that you are a God who works. We've heard about your workings in incredible places around the globe. Today and now we focus for a moment on how you've worked in the lives of one of us here. We want to thank you for your call, your special call in, in Joel to full-time pastoral ministry. We come as a Family and friends as a church to recognise that and acknowledge that. Father, we pray that you will indeed bless everything that is said and done here in this service. We pray a special blessing on Joel, his family, all the ministerial colleagues and each and every one of us, Lord, because we, we want to thank you and praise you that you are a God who calls each of us in our various spheres of influence to minister and work for you. So, Lord, we want to commit ourselves to you in this service to you, knowing that through your spirit you are present and you will bless. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this afternoon we, uh, we have a, a number of uh, people who are going to be leading out and taking part in the program. These will be mentioned as, as, the, program, as the program goes on. But I guess by way of, of sort of setting the scene, I thought it might be helpful to just provide a little bit of a, an overview on, and, a, and provide a little bit of a background to Joel Slade and uh, his ministry so far. Uh, Joel Slade was born in 1988 in Mwollomburra in northern New South Wales, uh, lived in various locations uh, north of New South Wales and into, into Queensland, but settled at, settled at Queenscliff. Uh, Joel shares that around the age of 16, he began to wrestle with what to do with his life. Uh, he thought he would be a builder, uh, but then he, he really sensed a, a desire to do something working with people and, and began a sense of a call to ministry. It was at an AYC, or an Australian Youth Conference, where there was a call to ministry made by Randy Skeet, and Joel responded to that call. In 2007, uh, Joel uh, went to Avondale College and uh, studied for the first uh, half of the year. And then he moved to the United States and uh, went to the Mission College of Evangelism run by Louis Torres in Oregon, USA. The following year, he returned to Australia and uh, was picked up as a youth pastor at Kingsliff Church. He volunteered in Fiji later that year as a chaplain, Bible teacher at Navaso SDA School. However, during his time there, Joel got sick with dengue fever and so had to come home. I'm not sure, Joel, whether it was because of that that you then considered whether you should do nursing. Uh, Joel prayed about it for six months. 
uh, but I came across uh, a couple of significant passages in Scripture that, that were pivotal at that point in time, one being Daniel 2.29, and the other one, the, uh, the incident in Luke chapter 7 of the Pharisees not listening. And I guess these were, these were turning points for Joel uh, in his life, and uh, he tells me that as a result of that, he changed his application from nursing to theology. In 2009, Joel returned to Avondale College, Yet in the second half of that year, he had the opportunity to go to Pompeii in Micronesia, where he was a Bible teacher and chaplain at our Adventist school there. In 2010, returned to Avondale College and then con uh, continued and finished his degree, his theology degree, through to the end of 2013. During that period of time, so from 2010 to 2013, uh, Joel had the opportunity to conduct something like six evangelistic series in the Philippines during his semester holidays, taking teams with him, teams of people with him on each of those trips. Throughout that whole time, uh, some 300 people were baptised and joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The second last two years of Joel's study, he worked, so 2012 and 2013, uh, Joel worked with Pastor Danny Milenkov at the Blue Haven Church Plant, and then graduated with a Bachelor of Ministry and Theology at the end of 2013. In 2014, Joel was appointed as the pastor of My House Ministry Centre, which is a church plant in Newcastle. He completed his internship under Pastor David Stoichich. In 2017, he was relocated and worked at the Kingscliff Church as the associate pastor until the end of last year, when he accepted the call to become youth director for here in the South Australian Conference. Joel, it is an absolute privilege and pleasure to have you joined our team here in South Australia, and may God bless you on your ordination today. As has been mentioned, uh, most of Joel's ministry has been in the North New South Wales Conference. We are privileged this afternoon to be able to have uh, my counterpart from North New South Wales, Pastor Neil Thompson, the Ministerial Secretary for that conference, uh, with us today. In a moment, he's going to come up and share a few words. And uh, before he does that, he has brought uh, Joel a message uh, from a number of your colleagues and uh, pastoral mates from the North New South Wales Conference, which we're going to listen to and play right now. Thank you. Joel, on behalf of all of us here in North New South Wales, we just want to say congratulations on your ordination today. We love you. That's it. Wishing you all the best. So excited for you, mate. God bless and um, yeah, take the youth closer to the Lord. Amen. Hey, Joel, you're missing you, mate. I uh, miss playing uh, a choir with you. And hey, mate, congratulations on this big ordination. Hey, bro, I love you, man. I really wish that I could be there um, as you celebrate this. But uh, yeah, wish you all the best, bro. Hey, Joel. <laughs> Joe, I just want to say um, that I'm so pleased and uh, excited about your ordination. You have been my first English friend in my whole life. And um, yeah, I'm very pleased, uh, pleased to have you as my best friend as well. Thank you. Hey, Joel, I just want to say congratulations to your ordination. And we miss you in this conference, man. And all the best with your new role as youth director. You're going to kill it, mate. God bless. Brother Joel, it's been a blessing to do ministry with you back from one mission all the way through to Kingscliff Church and now doing youth ministry together. So praying that you be a blessing to the youth down there and uh, all the best for your ordination. God bless, mate. You. God bless, brother. Yo. Hey, Joel, just super excited about your ordination. Wish I could be there to celebrate with you. All North New South Wales wish we, wishes we could be there to celebrate with you. God has really led in your life and ministry, and we're very proud of you. God bless. <laughs> On that note, we'll introduce Neil Thompson. Thank you, Neil, for coming down. There's no embarrassment in that at all, is there? 
you got to love that image of Jodie just now to fill that in Jodie is one of our um, well she's actually in charge of occupational health and safety in our conference and uh, she just used to love Joel she was working on our front reception desk when Joel used to come into our conference office to do recordings for radio and that's where Joel and I actually rubbed shoulders quite a bit was doing the morning show for Faith FM and one of the things that I'm not sure that you actually realize, perhaps you get more of an insight into that just hearing what Joseph shared, is that at the heart of Joel is an evangelist. He's an evangelist at heart. He's actually sold out for that. Whether it's nursing, whether it's ministry, it wouldn't have mattered because it's all focused on people and serving people, healing people and leading them to Christ. One of the things that I really like about Joel, and this is what Jody was sort of hinting at, missing him, is that he's a really easygoing guy, right? You get that? Yeah, of course. With a killer punch. We would be talking on radio and we'd be talking about, you know, just having a, a bit of a fun banter between often Joel and... Um, Adele and myself, and we'd be chatting, and then all of a sudden, Joel would bring us right back to point with a killer blow, and I'm like, oh, there's a spiritual gift there. I don't know if it's in the Bible as a spiritual gift, the killer punch, but if it was, it'd be, it'd be the one that, that would be given to Joel as, as his thing. In, in his years of ministry, um, the, the churches where he served were, were two very different churches. My house, um, an inner city church in Newcastle that was characterizing itself by not being Adventist um, is kind of how that they would have seen themselves a little bit because they wanted to just to try and figure out a whole new way of reaching out to Australians. Um, it, very evangelistic at their core, but wanting to do that in a very unique way. And Joel just worked right along with them and helped them. And then he goes from there into Kingscliff, his home church, and really a very different experience of working there. Joel, there's a lot of people, not just those few who are there, and you'd, the one who just said, hi, Joel. I actually worked with Joel quite a bit at Kingscliff, um, Kyle Morrison, and uh, great mates, and all of them actually just wanted me to convey to you um, the sincere um, delight they have with you actually in, in progressing to this stage in your ministry and to wish you the very best in the future. There's a, there's a Bible verse I just want to share with you. It's um, right there from Ephesians chapter 3. If Justin Lawman were here today, he would take us to chapter 4, which we'll go to in a minute. You know the verse that's coming. And it's this. Now to him who is able, this is Ephesians 3 verse 20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Just think about that. Just, th this, is a, this is almost like a climactic hymn to Jesus. And here he's actually saying to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly, limitless, without limit, beyond all that we could ever imagine, according to the power that works in us. To him be glory. Then he goes on to say in chapter 4, he says, Therefore... Therefore, I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling which you were called. Joel, I wish this was happening in North New South Wales, but it's happening here in South Australia. Delighted for South Australia. Um, you're our greatest export. And seriously, you don't know. Like, Joel and I were just chatting over lunch, and he's, he wants to put a bomb in your conference. Yeah? Yeah, he does. The right sort of bomb. It's like to, to actually win the hearts and minds of young people, not just young people, but people in your church and lead them to Jesus and, and so on. So I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling which you were, you were called for with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love as you so ably are able to do, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, Joel. He, Paul goes on to say, and I won't read all of chapter 4, but it's right there for you. He actually goes on to say, though, and he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some were trained under Louis Therese, and I'm glad that you were because that gives him a real missional heart and, and focus. Some pastors and teachers, and here's your purpose, Joel, in ministry, for the equipping of the saints 
for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Joel, on behalf of all of the crew back there in North New South Wales, who love you dearly and wish you the very best in ministry. As you go in ministry, always go with that focus to be a trainer and equipper of the saints for ministry. In, in our conference at the moment, we're reflecting and I call it play dates we're having with our pastoral team. Where we're getting together and we're just talking about one book at the moment. It's Hero Maker. It's how you can actually, with your team, actually help your team in your local church be the heroes and your role as pastors to be the hero maker. In youth ministry, do the same. Be the hero maker. Be the one who lets your team be the heroes of getting success in ministry and and taking the center stage and the spotlight and directing, and they get the privilege of directing others to Jesus. And as you do that more and more, God will use you more and more as he, as he keeps your feet firmly on the ground and, and you just let the influence of your personality, which God's blessed you with, just let that be something which just raises up a generation of people who can finish the work and much more than that, be a blessing to so many others. Joel, God bless you, man. It's a privilege to be here and just to share in this today. And on behalf of North East, New South Wales, boy, that's a mouthful. South Australia is so much easier to say. God bless you in your ministry in years to come. So what are we actually doing here today? If God calls all of us to ministry, and he does, and if what Neil just quoted from the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 4, if God equips all the saints for ministry and he does, then what are we doing ordaining one person here? Well, reality is, as was mentioned in in Joseph's overview, God called Joel to pastoral ministry a long time back when you sensed that call as a teenager. Sure, that journey traces through different places, including Fiji and including your various studies, including considering nursing, God has called and shaped and grown and put people into Joel's life to shape him for pastoral ministry. And today it's the body of Christ, in this case, the body of Christ in South Australia, saying, hey, Joel, we affirm your calling. We see how God is called because part of that calling process is the affirmation of the body. And that's what we're doing today. Sure, Joel has been pastoring and been ministering, we've heard some of that today, in all sorts of contexts. But today it's the church catching up with God's calling and saying, yes, we affirm that calling and we see in Joel the competencies, we see in Joel the ability, and most of all, we see in Joel the character for pastoral ministry. And that pastoral ministry is not just in South Australia, nor is it Australia-wide. What we're saying today, what we do here today, matters to the worldwide Seventh-day Adventist Church. And who knows where, Joel, you get taken from here until wherever God leads you in ministry, who knows where that is? But the ordination that, when Joel has prayed the ordination prayer today, That's something our worldwide Adventist church regards. And regardless of what discussion you might have on ordination, that's a pretty significant thing for us to be praying a blessing in Joel's ministry, to be saying, here's the body of Christ recognizing. It was about 2,900 years ago, some people say 2,600 years ago, that a guy called Joel was wandering across the Judean deserts And apparently it was an incredible drought, one of the biggest droughts they had seen to that point. If you read it in scripture, it says the locusts had even run out of food to eat. The locusts had marched through the country eating everything. And here's Joel, a young man called by the Lord with a message to share and a mission to complete in a drought-stricken piece of land. Now, South Australians, I don't know if you've driven much out of Adelaide, but I came across from Melbourne. I don't think it can get much drier. I think there's a guy called Joel who's called to a drought-stricken piece of land. 
I didn't see the locusts out there eating, but if I was a locust, I wouldn't find anything out there to eat at the moment. And I was, they are, I was talking to the Mr. Pope, the honey man, and he said, I'm sick of driving over dusty paddocks looking for flowers that have no nectar. It sounded like what Joel describes in the book of Joel, a dry, desolate place. But 2,900 years ago, this guy called Joel had a mission. His mission was to bring renewal. And he actually says there's streams of renewal coming to the people. And he says, I want renewed hearts. I'm calling people to renew their commitment to God. He says, don't rent out your robes. Don't tear your robes off. He says, tear your heart open and allow God to transform and you become the streams of living water in a dry and thirsty place. Joel, I think 2,900 years later, there's still people called Joel and I still think they turn up in dry, thirsty places. And I still think God asked young men called Joel to say, open your hearts to the streams of living water and let God's abundance flow through this thirsty land. The most famous passage from the book of Joel is where it talks about sons and daughters. Sons and daughters who are going to prophesy and young people who are going to have, it, have dreams and visions. Could it be that a few thousand years later that God's calling you as a youth director in this conference at this time in your ministry and who knows what other areas he's going to call you to but maybe at this time you're called to those sons and daughters and you're called to those young people and you're called to bring streams of living water into them and see their streams of living water flow into South Australia, which desperately needs the living water of Christ. And could it be God's call then is still the call in your life now and he still raises up Joel's and he still has young people to do his mission and he still has young people to impact other young people. And here, I'm looking around at parents with sons and daughters. And Joel, you're called to inspire them, to encourage them, to have them see bigger pictures of who God is, bigger pictures of what the church is, and bigger pictures of what Adventism can do in this part of Australia. As Neil mentioned, we're all called to ministry, but in Ephesians 4, Paul says, some to do the work of evangelism, some call to pastoral ministry. And Joel, to see how you've responded to that calling, to see where the various challenges you've already been through, and to see the way you've stuck your head up and said, I've been called and I'm going to do this. Throughout your ministry from here to whatever God calls you next, in the charge you're going to respond to today, it's going to say in season and out of season. And sometimes it's in season and sometimes it's out of season. And sometimes the countryside is beautiful and sometimes it's dry and barren. But through all those seasons, you just keep calling people to the Lord and you keep calling people to renewal of the streams of living water that flow through them. In Ephesians 3 and 4, where Neil, Neil quoted from, Paul actually says... Sure, you're called to pastoral ministry, but it's not about you. Today is not about Joel. Today we're actually here because Joel has chosen to give his life away. Or the same guy who wrote Ephesians 4 and Romans 12 calls it a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing unto God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Or elsewhere he goes to live his Christ to die his gain. Or elsewhere, he says, it's no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. Everywhere you look, Paul keeps saying, hey, whether I'm in chains or whether I'm not, whether I'm in jail or whether I can preach, it's God's life anyway. And I think we can affirm what Paul writes in Ephesians, Ephesians 3 and 4. Where it says, beyond imagination, beyond what's even possible, is what God wants to do in the life of someone, it says, it's no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. So we're not here to celebrate Joel. We're here to celebrate that Joel has given his life away. And we're here to celebrate a teenager who sent a calling in 
of God in his life, who follows that calling, who avails himself to training and to mentoring and to coaching and to peers who sharpen those gifts. And today, as the church body in South Australia, as the church body of Australia, we commend Joel to the world as someone who's given his life away in service. And when you respond to to your charge in a moment, Joel, you're giving your life away. Like all of us are called to give our life away, but some are called to be called to be pastors. That brings with extra responsibility. We'll be cheering you on and encouraging you, supporting you. Sometimes it's streams of living water, sometimes it's drought. But to a drought-stricken piece of Australia, Joel, I believe you're called, you're called to inspire young people and may God continue to work in and through you as you continue to give your life away. I've asked Joel to come up here because he's a slippery guy to catch. He's either on the phone or he's not contactable. So, Joel, stand right here, mate. Um, I just want to affirm... I was in the bathroom when you called. (laughs) I called you about five times. (laughs) Over an hour. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) We'll leave that there, I think. Uh, Must be the white shoes. (laughs) It's amazing to see how God worked through our appointment committee process last year and... um, I guess my first communication with Joel was a text message uh, and he responded and he was at Kuala Lumpur Airport and uh, over the next couple of days we corresponded several times and spoke several times. I think I messed up your time away. But uh, I just want to thank God for uh, leading our conference to you and the brief time I've known you I've seen a real depth of maturity. Um, Someone that like all of our ministers, is is an equal colleague that I learned from, and uh, God has really put a calling on your heart. Mm. Uh, I'd like to invite all of our ordained ministers or commissioned ministers that are here to stand. We're going to... um, We're going to go through the ordination charge. So if you're an ordained minister or commissioned minister, we would invite you to stand at this time because this charge is for each one of us to to reaffirm as well. And and this will be for Joel, but for each one of us, and that will be followed by the ordination prayer. After the charge, we'll invite all of the ordained ministers or commissioned ministers to come forward onto the stage. Joel, Philip, Slade. God has called you to the work of pastoral ministry and the church. In recognising that call has set you aside by the laying on of hands today. Your ordination is recognised by the Adventist church worldwide, but such honour involves great responsibility. I charge you to minister as a servant, remain humble and teachable, and make the master your lifelong study. Mm. By spending time with Jesus you will become like him. It is by beholding that we become changed. Be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. I charge you to minister as a shepherd. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. I charge you, Joel, to minister as a watchman, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching, but you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, so the work, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill ministry that God has called you to. I charge you to minister as a teacher, nourish people in the words of faith and in good doctrine in which you have carefully followed. Mm. Feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. And when your work is ended, may you say with Paul, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. Mm. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Mm. I'm now going to invite all of our ordained pastors or commissioned ministers to come forward onto the stage as we do an ordination prayer and the laying on of hands of Joel. So please come forward.
We're going to pray now and we'd invite you to bow where you are as we kneel. Father in heaven, we just want to thank you that on this Sabbath, we are here to praise, to glorify and honour you. And Father, this afternoon we do that because you have set aside Joel for pastoral evangelistic ministry. You have called him dear Lord. And Father, the world church has recognised that and today is a demonstration of recognising his calling that you have called him to. Father, we thank you that from birth you had a path outlined for him. You had a role, you had a ministry. And as we've heard, there could have been several turns in that, dear Lord, several different options, but we thank you that Joel, um, by the reading of Scripture, by praying, by seeking you, it became evident and clear to him that you were calling him to full-time pastoral ministry. Father, we thank you for the gifts and the talents that you have given him. We thank you that he is using those and has used those in ministry right across the world in various places he's been. We thank you, dear Lord, for making him a unique individual, for someone full of empathy, someone that listens, someone it is so easy to relate to, someone that can communicate, someone that can preach the word, dear Lord, with authority, someone to call sin for what it is, but preach powerful grace. We thank you, dear Lord, and we give you honour and glory for the souls, the lives that have been led to you, and Joel has been a part in that. We thank you for that. Father, we pray a protection around him, a hedge. May your angels encircle him, dear Lord. May your Holy Spirit be continually evident in his life. May he seek you, Lord, on a daily basis, in the good times, in the tough times. May you be his ever-present friend. Father, may he be faithful, though the storms and the challenges come. May he not waver, may he not bend, may he not fall. May he know that you are there walking beside him. And Father, we pray that through his life of ministry, that he may lead others to the foot of the cross. That through his ministry, other people may see you, dear Lord, that their lives might be changed. Father, you know the, the course of his ministry, you know what turns, you know what directions, you know what places he will minister in. But wherever he ministers, he knows that he is called by you to this worldwide movement. Father, um, bless his future. Again, the plans are laid out, are laid out for his life, personally, dear Lord professionally, his calling, his vocation, dear Lord. May you reach into every area of his life as he surrenders it to you. May he commit everything to you, dear Lord. And on this day, on this afternoon, at this time, we give you praise and honour for what is exhibited in Joel's life. And we pray this special prayer of blessing in, through the name of Jesus. Amen.
Chief. Well, uh, Joel, uh, on behalf of the ministerial team, I've been given the privilege to uh, welcome you to ministry in this very special way. Uh, now you should feel holy and, and, and more powerful. And uh, I think you're floating a couple of inches higher uh, than usual because you've been prayed over by us as uh, your mentors and friends. But the reality is uh, now that you're, you're, you're in ministry in this particular way and it's uh, been acknowledged that God has been working through you uh, to connect the lost with him. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't sound like it's all roses from now on. But instead... Uh, we as pastors here aren't here to scare you. Uh, we're not here to uh, leave you simply with God, but instead we're, we're here to be used by God to support you. So we've come up uh, today to pray upon you, to acknowledge what God is doing in your life, but also to say that we are here for you uh, as you walk this way in, the ministry, in ministry. Joel and I get to work together very closely uh, in the youth department, and if support simply means that we sit together in the office and stare each other in the eye and gaze into each other's eyes, then we will support you in that way. If so support says that we will sit there and drink kombucha and try all the different flavors, then that's what we're willing to do because we know that God has called you to a very special ministry and here in South Australia with our children, uh, our young people, and uh, we can't wait to see what else he has in store for you. So welcome to the team in this very special way. God bless. On behalf of the conference, Joel, please accept that as a, a gift and a way to remember this special occasion and also your ordination certificate. And now we're going to give you the opportunity to, uh, to respond. Thank you. Preacher's got to preach. You can't stand behind the stage. You can't hide behind the, the thing there. Um, I, I, I just want to start by saying that I, I don't stand up here alone. I, I stand on the shoulders and the backs of the, the countless people that have supported me in my ministry. If, if they were all to be here, we wouldn't fit in this place. I... I think especially of my grandfather who in the late stages of his life said that I, I asked him a question, Grandpa, what's, what's the most important thing you've ever done? And he told me, he was, he was quite elderly at this stage, he said, my decision to follow Jesus, regardless of the pressure from my family and my friends, has paid dividends in my life. I'm standing here as a result of his decision. I'm standing here as a result of the call that God placed on his life to come forth from the darkness into the light. And I thank him. I thank God for the way that he led him, and my family, as a result of me uh, on my journey. But I have to acknowledge that because I'm not alone. The, the few people that were on the screen yelling and screaming, <laughs> they, they represent a small number of people that have supported me over the years in ministry. There have been many questions of this call that you each speak of in my life. But at each and every stage on the journey, with each and every question, God has always sent faithful men and women to answer that question. And when the faithful men and women weren't there to answer that question, in the quietness of my mind, in the quietness of my room, in the quietness of the wilderness, God was there to answer that for me. And so I stand up here today thanking God for the way that he has led in my life, for the way that he has confirmed that call time and time again. And I just want to thank uh, Brendan for, for sharing, for pointing out the obvious as to how dry this place is. Um, I've said to many of you, the greenest thing here is the Bunnings. I, <laughs> it's literally the only thing you can count on, but uh, I'm still waiting for winter. But um, I just wanted to read this verse. Um, 
my, my life has, um, yeah, seen many, many uh, different facets and uh, many corners. But it says here in Mark chapter 10, And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that has left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels, but that he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life. What I've given up for the gospel call pales in comparison to what Jesus gave up for me. It pales in comparison. It pales in comparison. I cannot even compare. I praise God for the way that he has called and for his mercy in giving me opportunity to respond. If it were up to me, If it were up to my giftings, my capabilities, I wouldn't be here today. But the song we sung at the start, Great Is Thy Faithfulness, that should be the easiest song for a Christian to sing. Because that is our song. It is His faithfulness to us. And I stand here today as a testament to that. So I want to thank you, South Australian Conference. I believe that I am in a season of blessing right now. I I believe that I can see God working in my life in ways that I could never believe. I could have never thought, even months ago. And yet here we stand. And so I wanted, I believe that it, it it was important to be ordained here in this place. Many friends were were telling me, you're getting ordained in the wrong place. Many friends were saying you needed to do that in North New South Wales. But just as they have carried me this far, I am looking to each of you to continue that journey. I am looking to each of you, to the ministers that were just here, to to you, David, to Joseph and the rest of the pastoral team, the families that you represent, the church families that we represent as a conference. I am looking to you for support. I cannot do this alone. I have not done this alone. My God will supply all of my need, and I believe that he has in each one of you. And so I thank him for the season of ministry and the season of blessing that we are in and for the way that he is going to use each one of us to grow his kingdom here in this area. I believe nothing short of a miracle is taking place here in South Australia. And I believe that at the end of the year, we will all be able to say together, surely our God has shown up. Surely our God, who we have been praying to, has done something. It certainly wasn't David. It certainly wasn't Joseph. And we don't even remember that Joel guy. (laughs) But God was here, and he has done something great. And so I thank you, each one. I thank uh, those who have traveled here. I thank the ministers in the Philippines and all those around the world that have supported me the many years in ministry. And I thank each one of you for the way that you are going to continue to do so. Thank you very much. powerful burden that God has put on Joel's heart that we've recognised. In some ways this is like a marriage, in some ways it's like a baptism, and at a baptism there always is a call for other people to make a commitment. And we've heard a bit about Joel's journey and for the few short months that we've got to know Joel and, and our youth, I'm sure there are things that they've picked up about Joel that they are really see God leading in his life. But I know here this afternoon there is probably someone else or maybe more than just a someone that God is putting a burden on their heart for the gospel ministry, for full-time gospel ministry. Maybe for some time God's been pricking your conscience and you've been avoiding it. Maybe you've been toying with the idea and wrestling with it with God. But I wonder today if there is someone here that God may be calling for gospel ministry. And if there is, I would invite you to stand. If God is calling you to gospel ministry, please stand. If anyone anyone here would like to know more about gospel ministry or to see what it entails, we would also invite you to stand. 
And if God puts a burden on your heart, praise the Lord, Brother Eric. If God puts a burden on your heart, we would encourage you to stand. In Romans chapter 10, the Apostle Paul says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. I'm wondering if there is anyone else that feels a calling to explore gospel ministry or who feels that call. We're going to pray right now. We're going to pray for you, Eric, whatever calling it is, whatever capacity that is. And our brother over here as well, and there are more. We'd invite you after the close of Sabbath to come forward so we can have our ministry team pray with you, but we'll stand and we'll pray at this time. Father God, we're living in a dying world, a world that is yearning to hear truth, a world that is yearning to have something concrete and certain, a world that wants answers and you are the answer. And Father, not only do we praise you for working through Joel's life, each one of our lives, dear Lord, but particularly this afternoon, we just want to praise you for the people that have made a stand, dear Lord, that feel a sense of calling, dear Lord, into ministry. And Father, you know how you've been working on their hearts. You know, dear Lord, what the next stages and steps in their life's journey is. We pray, dear Lord, that the Holy Spirit will continue to wrestle with them till the way is made clear for the path that you have for them. Father, may your angels surround them. May they protect them. And may your Spirit guide them through whatever ministry course that you want them to take. Bless them, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. So we'd ask you to come forward at the end of close of Sabbath in about 10 minutes' time. May God bless you. Thanks, Pastor Joel. We're now going to invite Kim Bussell to come forward, one of Joel's friends. He's going to do a close of Sabbath for us, and that will then be followed by uh, one of Joel's favourite hymns. Pleasure to be here. Pleasure to be with uh, Pastor Joel. I traveled all the way from Africa to have the privilege to be here for this occasion. I'm, I'm thrilled that he invited me. Um, and if you, just for a few minutes, uh, it deserves so much more than that. We're going to look at a parable that Jesus told in Luke chapter 10. And we're going to begin with verse 25. And we're going to go through it very quickly. It's very familiar to you. But uh, by God's grace, we'll get a gem of thought here that may inspire us. A certain man came to Jesus and he said, Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus, passing the question back to him, said, What do you read in the law? How do you understand it? And the man said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love what? Your neighbor is yourself. What did the man want? What was he longing for? What was the question about? Eternal life. Is that a good question? Is that a good interest? And so Jesus, knowing the man was actually testing him, says, well, what do you understand? Man repeats it. What I just told you. And Jesus says, you've got it. That's exactly right. Do what you've just said, and you will live. How long will he live if he does that? Any answers? Thank you. Eternally, he was asking about what kind of life? Eternal life. Jesus says, do it, and you will live. You'll have eternal life if you do that. And the Bible says, he wishing to justify himself, asked the question. Remember the question? Who is my neighbor. This was a point of dispute among the people. Now maybe you can help me. As my studies read scripture, there were two groups of people in the world at this time. To the Jewish mind, the world was divided 
into two categories of people. Anyone who want to risk guessing who those people are? How do we identify them? Jews and Gentiles. You agree? I don't want to put words in your mouth. There were Jews and Gentiles. Now, I'm sorry to bring this a little bit home for us, okay? But I would be, I would be amiss if I didn't. And now I praise God that he led me where I am today. I was an atheist, a heathen, an unbeliever. And step by step, God got my attention. And, and many years ago, he led me into this movement, the great Adventist movement. And yet it wasn't too long after I got into the movement, I learned the world is divided into two groups of people. Do you know what they are? We have Adventists. Thank you. We have some honesty here. I was the president of a worldwide ministry for many years. I had a Baptist accountant. And I took him to some Adventist conventions and he comes home to me and says, Kim, what is it with you people? You talk about people being non-Adventists. What in the world does that mean? I don't go to my friends, you see that person, that brother there, he, he's a non-Episcopalian. And that guy over there, he, he's a non-Methodist. What are you talking about? The only thing we learn from history is that we learn absolutely nothing from history. Have you ever heard that? As Seventh-day Adventists, we see the world with two groups of people. Very unfortunate, and I, and I just challenge us in, in that perception of the world because the world knows how we perceive them. But let's go on with the story. We have about five minutes. So Jesus then tells the story of a man traveling from Jericho to Jerusalem. He falls among thieves. They strip him of his clothing. They beat him. He's left half dead, naked on the trail. And a Levite comes along. And he looks at him and he carries on. And a priest comes along and looks at him, and what does he do? He carries on. He's not gonna get involved with this guy, right? This is a true story. This, just, this wasn't just something Jesus picked out. This really happened. Now, we have an advantage. We've read the scripture. The disciples did not have that advantage. As they're listening to Jesus tell the story, everybody in the crowd, including the disciples, story's okay. So far, so good. You shouldn't involve yourself with that guy. Everybody feels we shouldn't involve ourselves with that guy, and they think the story of Jesus is good. Jesus continues. And, and some of you went to school when there were blackboards. Anybody here? Blackboards, they don't have those anymore. Those are, I mean, like, those are for dinosaurs, those are for us. Right? But just imagine someone with a good, strong set of fingernails taking them and raking them down that blackboard. You got it? You got that, that wonderful feeling you get? Yeah. As soon as Jesus said, and then a Samaritan came along, it was like doing that. When Jesus said the word Samaritan, it was repulsive. It was horrible to their ears to listen to Jesus just say the word Samaritan. They were thoroughly despised. They'd rather be a dog than be a Samaritan. The Samaritans had a confused doctrine. Would you agree? Jesus told the woman at the well, we worship. As Jews, we worship. We know what we worship. You Samaritans, what? You don't know what you worship. That was Babylon. I mean, that was, that was a mixture. That was truth and error. Everything was mixed up for the Samaritans. And Jesus says, now, a Samaritan comes along, and he's got everybody's attention. Their ears are not feeling very good, but he's got their attention. And he says, this man came and found the person that was laying there half dead, got off with his oil and his wine. He, he cleaned up the man's wounds. He ministered to him very gently, very carefully, put him on his own beast at the risk of his own life and took him to a safe place. He stayed all night with him, and when he was sure he was past the critical stage, he was sure this man was going to recover, the Samaritan goes to the innkeeper, he pays him, and says, if you spend anything extra when I'm gone, when I come back, I'll pay you. This guy was a medical missionary par excellence, folks. Okay? He had what's called 
Thank you. That's not one of our 28 fundamental beliefs, compassion. The Samaritan had something called compassion. And you know what, folks? When he found that man, he could not take another step. He couldn't. He had to stay. He had to help this man. He could not take another step. Why? Because that compassion deep down in him would not let him go forward with peace. He had to do what he had to do. He could not take another step and leave that man to perish. And then Jesus asked the question, which of the three was neighbor to the one that fell among the thieves? You remember the answer? The Samaritan. Is that what they said, Joel? No. What'd they say? The one who showed compassion. They wouldn't even say the word Samaritan. Wouldn't take it on their lips. And then Jesus says, go and do likewise. Okay. What was the man's original question? What was his question? Thank you. What must I do to inherit what? Eternal life. We go through this, and Jesus says, go and do likewise. If he does and does, if he goes and does likewise, what will he have? Is that a stretch? Am I, am I stretching this concept? That was the original question. Now I want to ask you, what did the Samaritan have? Thank you. The Samaritan had what? You go do what the Samaritan just did, and you will have what? That's a stretch, folks. Now this guy's doctrines, the Samaritan's doctrines were confused, but I want to tell you something. His theology was correct. His understanding about who God was was correct, even though his doctrines were messed up. And I wonder about today, I wonder, are there some Samaritans out there having eternal life? Because they've allowed God to work in their lives, to work in their hearts. They've allowed God to conquer them with his love. And when they see another human being in help, what do they have inside? Compassion. And I want to submit to you the joy we might have if we would rediscover or discover more intimately the 29th fundamental belief. No, it's not what it's called. It's called compassion. And I want to tell you something. I've, I'm thrilled with ministry. I'm thrilled with evangelism. All my adult life, that's what I've been involved in since God called me and got my attention. I want to tell you something the Samaritan wasn't doing. In his mind, as he was serving this man, he's wounded. He's bleeding. He's caring for him. He takes him to an inn. He pays his bill. You know what the Samaritan wasn't thinking? You know, I'm going to help this guy. And as I bless him, and as I minister to him, and I get close to him and help him, maybe, just maybe, he'll want to become a Samaritan too. You follow me? That was not on his agenda. Compassion for a fellow human being in need is what was in the heart of Samaritan. May God bless us. May he give us the gift of compassion. Amen. Hello. Would you please join us, um, stand with us as we sing this final hymn today?
pray together. Father in heaven, we pause again in your presence. We thank you for a glorious day that's been promised, that we will be with you in your presence forevermore. Lord, we thank you for the promise of eternal life. And I ask your blessing on each one who has come here to Big Camp in South Australia. May your spirit and your angels draw close to them. May you bless them. May you make them a blessing. As we go forth from this place, Father, we long not to be alone. We long to have your presence. We long to have your companionship. And we pray for a miracle of grace, Lord. We pray that you will perform a miracle, that you will use us to be a blessing to others in this perishing world. We're not worthy for you to do this, but we pray because our need is great. And we believe your promises. You've promised that he or she, whoever comes to you, you in no wise cast out. So we place our prayers, our heart's desire before you. We ask you to use us to share your love. And we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>